Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Eight Critical Care Conference in Thailand. Together with the APA CCM Standalone Conference 2017. My name is Associate Professor Dr. Suthat Rungreung Hiranya. I'm going to be the moderator for this opening session. Critical care is quite a young specialty, but rather extremely important as our population increasingly ages and becoming ill. As such, over the past several years, the demand for intensivists all around the world has reached the new heights. Global shortage of intensivists has become overwhelming, while the number of critically ill patients continue to rise. Moreover, the shortage is not limited to the number of intensivists, but also to the healthcare budget. The practice of critical care worldwide nowadays therefore need to consider these limitations. To balance between all limitations, including shortage of personal, budget restraints, and quality of care, care among critically ill patients has to be optimal. We, Thai Society of Critical Care Medicine, therefore, has selected the optimal critical care to be the theme of our eighth critical care conference in Thailand. Since the optimal critical care would be the best way and the shortcut to strengthen this specialty globally with no doubt. To overcome this crisis, fighting against the challenge alone would be difficult and very lonely. Great friends like the Japanese Society of Intensive Care Medicine, JSICM, and Asia Pacific Association of Critical Care Medicine, APA CCM, have come and joined us this year again to build up another page of history of our International Critical Care Conference in Thailand to be one of the most fruitful and successful conference for everyone in the field of critical care. Now it's about time. I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Ross Freeman, the president of the APA CCM, to give us a welcome message. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Professor Ross Freeman. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Ross Friedman. Now, I would like to welcome Associate Professor Dr. Chan Chai Sitipan, the President of the Thai Society of Critical Care Medicine, to give us a welcome message and opening remarks. Uh, everyone, please welcome Associate Professor Chan Chai Sitipan. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Jit Siti Amon, our guest speaker, uh, friends from APCCM and JSICM, and all the um, 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 friends and colleagues. I would like to welcome you to our eighth International uh, Critical Care Society meeting of Thailand and the first APCCM standalone meeting, which is um, the first time we have such of this kind of meeting organized in Thailand this year. So I think. Um, the, the theme of this meeting this year is uh, optimal critical care, which I think is based on the concept of sufficient economy from our late beloved King Pumipon Adunidet. I think we will learn about how we can provide optimal critical care, which is sufficient from the um, resources we have how we can make the best out of the limited resource we have. I hope we can learn and we can share our experiences during this uh, exciting conference. ก็ผมในนามของนายกสมาคมนะครับก็ขอต้อนรับผู้เข้าร่วมประชุมทุกท่านที่เข้ามาร่วมประชุมในวันนี้นะครับเราก็มีหัวข้อซึ่งน่า
treated at the ward versus the ICU. And uh, it was reported in World Journal of Critical Care Medicine. And uh, in some setting, we have lower mortality in the ward setting. <laughs> But in some setting, we, in most settings, we have lower mortality uh, in ICU. And therefore, uh, this is a meta-analysis up to 2012. And you can see that ICU care has about 60% chance of uh, survival if, according to the current situation, so uh, this, is, uh, this, mean, this means that ICU may be important for us at this point in time. So what is the problem of cost effectiveness? I like to refer to uh, the concept of medical practice variation. People practice differently as a ward, as an ICU, as individual. And these medical practice variations are common, large, and systematic. It depends on what do you believe <laughs> when you practice, right? And, and doctors are uh, the, the most difficult person to control. And uh, we have, uh, but, but Practice variation has considerable implication for cost and outcome. This has been shown. You practice higher cost doesn't mean that you have better outcome. And therefore, what is the major source of practice variation? Uh, clinical uncertainty, ignorance of relevance research, and individual preferences, particularly uh, among the patient. Some patients, even though they know that it is not very useful uh, to get care, they request it because uh, in, in Thailand particularly, uh, people would say if you are the relative of uh, your parents and if you don't give uh, the care to the very end, despite the cost and ineffectiveness, you are not doing the duty <laughs> of your relative, uh, of, of, your, uh, of a son or a daughter. So uh, these are individual preferences. So when we want to practice this, we have to uh, talk about uh, identify uncertainty, uh, try to organize evidence, and keep up with evidence, and try to educate the patient. And uh, these are some uh, data from Thailand, surgical ICU, and you can see that the burden of, of, uh, of uh, ICU care is uh, actually sepsis, acute kidney injury, and so on. So if you can control practice variation about on, on the five important uh, condition, then you do a lot of favor in uh, identifying uh, ways to improve cost effectiveness. And this is the risk of mortality. Different conditions have different risks of mortality. And if the patient has several risks, you multiply uh, the risk, you have higher mortality that way. Uh, and uh, this is from surgical ICU. You can see that uh, complication in ICU, 20% are from sepsis. ARDS, and 16% are from AKI. So it means that if you target the higher burden, you may have a chance of improving cost effectiveness. And if you talk about the cost, if uh, the average aperture score is uh, considered the cost of one, then uh, having sepsis is 25 times the cost, and having uh, ARDS is 26 times the cost. And therefore, if you can prevent that condi those conditions, you reduce the cost greatly. All right? Uh, and uh, these are uh, the analysis of surgical ICU care in Thailand. And 
if you look at different ICU, uh, different set of ICU, you can see that there are also cost variation among the ICU. Some ICU are more expensive uh, than the others. For example, ICU care, uh, ICU one if, uh, is the reference of one. Uh, some ICU are 70% more expensive per day than the other ICU. So there are cost variation among ICU also. And these cost variation is because of the nurse patient ratio and patient density. And these nurse and patient ratio and patient density are important uh, to determine uh, the effective or evidence-based protocol because uh, during the past 25 years, we have uh, known a lot about how to improve survival. And these uh, on the right, on your right here, are the, uh, some effective intervention. And you need nurse to patient ratio and need appropriate patient density to deliver optimal care. Uh, and that is uh, one of the things that we have to consider. And uh, so to, to improve optimal care, you need to do earlier diagnosis and treatment. So pre uh, don't let the patient go to ICU if you possible, uh, if it is possible. For example, sepsis patient, identification early, then you don't need ICU. Cost-effective ICU care for treatable condition, uh, and we need to know evidence. For example, right now, we have done a lot of go-directed therapy for sepsis. Is it effective? Is it cost-effective? It costs a lot, but is it effective? Uh, I'll show you some of the things that we need. Cost-effective ICU care or treatable condition, and sometimes what we th uh, think as axiom, like uh, go-directed therapy for sepsis, might not be the most cost effective. And, uh, and patient empowerment during discharge planning. I'll show you the goal, directed uh, therapy for sepsis. Uh, this uh, was, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the idea was promoted 15 years ago uh, by uh, Rivers. And uh, he, the group said that we need to uh, insert central line to measure central oxygen uh, nation of the venous blood so that uh, we can to keep, have to keep the oxygenation uh, above 70% because if it is lower than 50%, then the patient died. And at that time, uh, we found that you know, it's uh, very effective you can reduce the mortality of sepsis patient a lot uh, at that time. Uh, and, and oh, sorry, I turned the next. A lot. And uh, at, at that time, the mortality from sepsis is about 40 to 60 percent. And reducing it by a lot means that, uh, yes. You know, you have done a good job. Now, right now, we can have better control of sepsis, early control, early diagnosis of sepsis, early diagnosis of infection, and early identification of potential sepsis. Do we need, do we still need uh, insertion of central venous, uh, central line for measuring central venous oxygenation? That's the question. And there are three randomized trials. Uh, one is called Arise in Australia, process in the US, and promise uh, in the UK. Talk, uh, trying to address this question, do we need to insert central line uh, for treatment of sepsis? And what is the benefit? And, uh, and you can see that uh, I just take one try, uh, the promise try, and uh, this is, uh, you can see that the baseline Data is very balanced, and if you talk about go-directed therapy, trying to insert central catheter, these are the things that additional things that you have to do. You know, more fluid, uh, 
uh, more vessel pressure, more double to beat, and so on and so on. And uh, just to 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 uh, adhere to uh, reverse principle of early goal directed therapy. And how about the outcome? Mortality the same, day free of uh, uh, and so on, and everything is the same. Is cold dead cold equivalent between usual care and early goal directed therapy. You know, and these are new research finding uh, because we have better identification of patient with uh, potential sepsis, early uh, treatment of sepsis, fluid therapy, and so on and so on. So insertion of a catheter using the goal-directed therapy, go early goal-directed therapy is not an important strategy anymore, for example. If you can reduce this, you can make things more cost-effective. The second is about SIR, systemic inflammatory response syndrome for identification of sepsis. This syndrome identifies SIR, uh, sepsis, uh, severe sepsis, and septic shock, right, or category. And uh, we question whether this is important, and therefore, the third international consensus definition on sepsis, uh, sepsis 3, if you come to ICU, you don't know sepsis 3, you are not uh, uh, actually up to date about, <laughs> about uh, sepsis anymore. They try to define a new definition uh, of, of sepsis and uh, septic shock, and they get rid of two definitions, which is uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, severe sepsis, severe sepsis and SIR, all right? So we only have two categories right now, sepsis or septic shock, and sepsis use organ dysfunction as a new way of thinking. Organ dysfunction means the brain, the heart, the lung. If you have the brain, the heart, the lung, and the kidney, liver died, then that is organ dysfunction. And septic shock is, uh, means that if you, uh, with organ dysfunction, if you try to maintain blood pressure and also uh, looking at lactate, you cannot really control, then you have what we call septic shock. And uh, this is, uh, so they rely a lot on SOFA or sequential organ failure assessment, and these are the the organ system that we access for, uh, for sepsis. And uh, they come up with uh, Q-SOFA, which is uh, outside ICU, you look at respiratory rate of more than 22, uh, outer mentation, systolic blood pressure, and SOFA, this is in, in the ICU uh, that you can calculate. And this is, uh, you know, uh, what sepsis tree has come up with. Uh, in other words, you try to uh, identify organ dysfunction using QSOFA. And then uh, if you are not sure, you think that there may be organ dysfunction, you use SOFA, and uh, if the SOFA is more than two, two organs, then you have sepsis. And then uh, despite adequate fluid, whether you can maintain mean arterial blood pressure of more than 65, and whether the lactate is more than two. If, if, uh, if you cannot maintain, then you have what we call septic shock. And this is the new plan. You don't, do not have to use SIR. And uh, there is an editorial saying that, I don't like you, sir. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Which means that. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is the, the, the article from JAMA again, showing that if you have a head-to-head -head comparison in ICU patient and look at the uh, uh, area under the curve, you see that so far in ICU, so far and uh, L, uh, and uh, and uh, this is this is a complicated way of uh, trying to identify sepsis using uh, formulas and so on. Uh, 
they are the best in prediction of, of sepsis, all right, and, and mortality. And if you use outside the ICU, non-ICU patient, so far, a lot are still the best, all right? And sir, cannot compare with the two. So, sir, do not identify at least 10% of the subject with sepsis. And, uh, and uh, so this is important that you uh, don't use sir and make sure that you identify sepsis using sir. You know, uh, there are some other better uh, data around to help you. And do we need hypertension, vasopressor, and lactate to identify septic shock? And uh, here's the data. If you have no, 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 or any other of these criteria, it means that you are not <laughs> identifying sepsis very well. And therefore, you need organ dysfunction, uh, hypertension, vasopressor, and lactate, okay? These are the three uh, most important criteria for validation and prediction of mortality. Now, that's about treatment of sepsis, which is the bread and butter of ICU care, right? Now, about long-term survival of uh, uh, tracheotomy, tracheostomy and long-term intubation. Do we, do we really need it? Uh, if you want to know, you go to look at Lancet Respiratory Medicine. All right, I don't uh, want to bring the data here. Just read this article, and uh, the implication is that tracheostomy for prolonged mechanical intubation with is associated with significant mortality, and therefore you should negotiate with the patient whether or not you need or do not need long-term tracheostomy. All right, <laughs> don't say that this is something that you need to do because you are the son of your parents. Uh, and uh, try to think about palliative care planning. That's, uh, that's the bottom line. I just want to show you the bottom line. And also, whether we need uh, fresh blood for ICU, you can show, uh, see that fresh blood is not important. It's, you can use old blood. And this can co uh, reduce the cost of ICU care. And uh, these are ventilated associate events uh, from possible, uh, from randomized trial, and, uh, and you can see, see that. Minimized sedation, uh, try to have spontaneous uh, 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 what, uh, breathing event therapy, early mobilization, and so on and so on. Uh, the black arrow are the ones supported by randomized trial. The gray arrow are the ones supported by cohort study. So this is evidence-based. If you practice evidence-based, the chances are that you can have cost-effective care. All right? And uh, just to give some data on tracheostomy, whether you need long-term uh, tracheostomy, you only shift the patient uh, to to die outside the hospital, but the mortality is similar, all right? And uh, this is uh, just, just to show that even you have low resource, this is low resource setting in developing country, ICU care is still worthwhile, as I have shown you already. But uh, the, for example, let's take sepsis. Right now, sepsis, the mortality should be around 20%. And uh, in low resource setting, they, uh, because of the lack of resource, they have, uh, have uh, about 50%. So we need to look at cost, uh, at practice variation among provider and among the patient to reduce these numbers uh, as best as possible. And you can improve it a lot if you use practice variation as a guide. Now, uh, this is about... Uh, empowering the patient uh, so that they choose the right cost-effective care. You have to hold family meeting, communicate prognosis, and try to have palliative care and informed consent to reduce waste. And uh, holding family meeting have to make early uh, 
And uh, there are certain principles of how to hold family meeting. You can copy this slide uh, for your own use. They are simple. Positive care also. And uh, informed consent. Uh, you have to provide information with the, uh, for the patient about informed cons uh, to get an informed consent with the option of no treatment. No treatment, no tracheostomy, because the survival is going to be similar, if possible, you know, and uh, uh, have uh, some serious discussion and uh, provide sedation for comfort of care, uh, non withdrawal of ventilation is not the same as withdrawal of, withdrawal of patient care. You can have patient care when you withdraw ventilation. i uh, give you an example of a patient who was in uh, CCU for a long time, and one day the, the relative phoned to call, how long are we going to keep her in the ICU? She is conscious and can converse very well and so on, CCU. And uh, right now her ejection fraction is about 15%, and uh, she actually cannot be off, you know, some of the supportive medication. If we withdraw that, she would certainly die. But she doesn't know that. She didn't know that. So we have a discussion and so on. And the patient, when was informed about this, uh, she said, I need probably two weeks. And after a good discussion and so on, with no option strategy, she decided that she wanted to go. And at that time, we keep her, uh, withdraw the supportive medication and uh, make her comfortable, as comfortable as possible. And in two days, she died. You know, and everyone is happy because they don't have to get into debt and so on and so on. And it's, it's very uh, important for them. So this is the most important slide. Sufficient economy, all right? So uh, the input is that we have to have knowledge, evidence-based knowledge. Don't um, uh, rely on your instinct. Re rely on evidence. You have to have integrity, honesty, diligence, respect for dignity, and have compassion. And if you have to pay money for ineffective care, would you do it yourself? Why do you have to ask the patient to do it? So these are the two conditions. Uh, and make sure that the decisions are reasonable, moderate, don't go, don't go to the extreme, don't use the most important high-tech possible that come out into the market, and have some self-immunity for protection, all right? and analyze practice variation among providers and the patient. And you would say, would you see some provider really want uh, doctor fee? And they want to use, recommend the most innovative technolo uh, technology, which might not be the best. And uh, make sure that you analyze practice variation among the subjects. All right, have a good discussion and so on. And cost effectiveness, dignity, and sustainability is the desirable outcome. And uh, with this concept of sufficient economy, I like to uh, say that ICU care is a cost center and can be very cost effective can provide good care if you use the principle of sufficient economy to proceed with your decision making on both on the side of the provider and the patient. And make sure that to do that well, you need to look at practice variation and make sure that the practice are in accordance with the best possible uh, knowledge available at this time and make sure that the patient uh, truly 
adequately informed about the options, including a no treatment option. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chip, for your very comprehensive and insight um, lecture. Even though he's not the intensivist, but he knows a lot about uh, intensive care treatment. Um, I think Dr. Kit, uh, I, I discussed and Dr. Kit would prefer if there is any, any, any questions uh, we can discuss about this important concept uh, right now. If you have any questions, if you have any questions, I think you want to comment on this, I want to ask you to ask Claude to ask you 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 to ask ผมคิดว่าเรื่องนี้เป็นความสําคัญมากเกี่ยวกับ ICU care โดยเฉพาะในประเทศไทยนะครับซึ่งเรารู้ว่าที่อาจารย์กิตพูดว่าเป็น ICU ยังไงเป็น cost center ให้แน่คือต้องใช้ cost แน่แน่ทำยังไงให้เราไม่ถูกมองว่าเป็นตัวผลานเงินโรงพยาบาลนะครับโดยไม่ได้ประโยชน์อะไรอย่างเงี้ยนะครับเดี๋ยวเราคงจะได้คุยเรื่องนี้ต่อไปเหมือนกันจากท่านใดมี do you have any comments or any questions So with this, I would like to thank uh, give, uh, thanks to Professor Chit very much, and I would like to invite him to sit on the panel so we can have uh, two more lectures coming, and we can discuss about these important topics uh, before the end of this session. Thank you very much. So the next speaker, I uh, be very honored to have uh, Professor Ross Thiebren, who is uh, president of APCCM. Um, He's uh, working right now at the University of Otago, and he he's a consultant and associate dean. His area of interest are education in critical care, ventilation, aeromedical transport, acid bed analysis. He will give us a talk in, entitled about the roadmap to optimal uh, effective ICU. Okay, please. Please join me to welcome Professor Ross. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you once again for inviting me to, this, to speak about something that I'm very keen to talk about. Um, my slides will um, overlap a little bit with the previous speaker, which we were talking about the same thing, how to develop an optimal intensive care. These are my declarations of interest. I don't think anything is conflicting. They're just that I have a role in intensive care training in Australia, New Zealand, and in other parts of Asia as well. So what does an optimal, optimal excellent intensive care unit look like? Well, in an ideal health system, the, uh, in an ideal world, ideal, with ideal health care, the individuals will be healthy, complications will be zero, and intensive care units will be empty. That's clearly not the case, and we've, we've pragmatically we need to deal with the fact that in our community we will have many intensive care patients who are critically ill who require our support. So what does intensive care do? It delivers intensive care therapy, um, including ventilation, continuous renal replacement therapy, ECMO and other pre pressor therapy and other therapies that can only be delivered in areas of high intensity. It provides level, high levels of nursing and medical expertise, and this is the area I want to focus mostly on during my talk. It is also an area where we can manage risk, and in particular the post-operative patient who, although no, they may not be unwell, is at risk of deteriorating, and we can intervene quickly, and also to provide not just therapy, but care, and in particular, the care of the dying patient, where although things are not going well, we can provide a level of care to improve the overall outcome and experience. So, intensive care therapies units um, are there to deliver intensive therapy. So what works? Well, we've already had a discussion about this, but there are many therapies that we are trying or are continuing to try, or at least assessing to see if they improve outcome our optimal use of, of fluids, types, and volumes, oxygen therapy, which we use high oxygen, low oxygen, um, and how we should use it. More recently, there have been data from Paul Marek and others about vitamin C and antioxidants and their use in intensive care. 
Coagulation therapies are still being looked at. We had the protein C um, and, and other therapies. Thrombomodulin is currently being looked at. And of course, there's now the complex area of agonist and antagonist mixing. Use of beta blockade after two or three days of high dose noradrenaline seems to improve outcome. An interesting field. So we need to know about this. This is the map of the world um, by geographical area. It's a typical map of the world showing New Zealand at the very bottom in the far left right hand corner. The rest of Asia displayed there. Now this is a map redrawn to demonstrate the research output in medicine. And as you can see, the size of the countries changed significantly. The countries in North America and in Europe are hugely overrepresented in, in, um, in research. The only area really in Asia is Japan. Our research output in the Asian, the most populous area of the world, is very low. This is an important factor in develop, developing intensive care practice that's going to be specific to Asian communities, Asian populations, and Asian diseases, is we have very little data to support what we do. So, we've already talked about this, but this is the PROMISE uh, process and ARISE studies, the in early goal-directed therapy, studies which showed after a large amount of study that there was no significant difference between the arms of the study using early goal-directed therapy or standard care. Very disappointing in some ways to many others, including myself, I wasn't that surprised. One of the interesting findings was from the American study that looked at three arms, early goal-directed therapy, prophylized care and usual care that there was a trend towards actually harm from using early goal-directed therapy. And in fact, usual care by non-protocolized and protocolized care was about the same, suggesting that it's not the therapy, but knowledge perhaps that may make a difference. This is some data from the Australasian group. This is our outcome of sepsis over a long period of time of 12 years, from really the time that early goal-directed therapy was first described until quite recently. This data shows a slow but progressive decline in the mortality from sepsis of patients in intensive care. Despite the fact that our therapies, early goal-directed therapy, protein C, albumin, and other therapies have all been shown individually to make no difference, somehow our interventions and our care has resulted in a much lower mortality. So that's an important finding. We have now, of course, more sophisticated machinery. This is a new ventilator and it demonstrates far better graphics on it and allows us to do better ventilation, perhaps. So we did 20 odd years ago a study in ARDS done by the Americans looking at high volume and low volume ventilation, 6 and 12 mils per kilogram. And there was a significant difference in mortality in the patients that had lower volume at 6 mils per kilogram ventilation. That's well known now, well described and everyone understands that we should give low tidal volume ventilation. This is some data from a study done in, um, in the mid-2000s on surfactant. The study was looking at the, t um, the use of surfactant to improve outcome in patients with ARDS. All the patients in this study had ARDS and all the, the investigators agreed to apply the principles of the ARDS protocol, low tire volume and pressure limiting ventilation. As you can see, that in fact the median ventilation was much higher than the six mils per kilogram. In fact, in some countries, Canada, Israel, Greece, and Switzerland, the tidal volumes got up to over 10 mils per kilogram. So despite us knowing that this was harmful, the application of the knowledge which we had was not done. It was possible, however, with some training to manage to get these countries, these, these units, to lower their tidal volumes but it took quite a bit of education. 
although the knowledge was there, the application of this therapy was not done. None of the proposals for the protective ventilation that have been suggested in the literature are expensive. They don't require expensive therapy. They're easy to apply. You simply turn the tidal volume down on the machine. So it's not a matter of capital expenditure or expense per patient. It's a simply a matter of knowing what to do and doing consistently. So it's not about our therapies. It's about education. So what does an optimal intensive care unit look like? Well, I think we have to provide excellent nursing and medical expertise. To do this, we have to have knowledge, and I've just talked about the fact that there's not as much research. We have to have good technology, and we have to deliver that. But importantly, we have to educate our staff. We have to know what we're doing. We have to have basic medical understanding, we have to translate the research learnings into practice and we have to have knowledge resources available to us so we can improve our, our therapies and our delivery of care all the time. We also have to have sufficient staffing so we can consistently do it. So learning is not compulsory but neither is survival and I think it's important if we're going to survive as a specialty to improve we have to continue to learn. Now, learning has changed over the years. It's no longer book-based. We can find and access information very quickly now using a phone, a phone that has more computing power than the Apollo 11 um, spaceship had when it went to the moon, in our hand, and everybody has one. So we can search all sorts of things. Why is my patient critically ill? We can look it up on the net instantly and get a result. Unfortunately, this comes with some hazards. Firstly, it's not filtered, and we're not sure about the availability, that, that, the validity of that information, how good is the information we're getting. But also, our patients, our clients, and their relatives can also use the internet and ask, how good is the intensivist that's looking after me? And so we get more and more conflict with families resulting from the fact that they have information as well that is also not filtered. So we need to be smarter about the information that we have. We need to know it well and be able to use it properly. There is information now, I'm going to talk about this later on this morning, asset base, a thing that astounds many of us and confuses all of us, is now available as an app. We can sort these problems out very quickly. Of course, there's always the chance that we'll have extracorporeal organ failure where our internet goes down, and I'm always concerned that in the future, if the internet goes down, a whole lot of patients will die in my ICU because that, no one actually knows anything anymore. They just Google it, and so patients will die. So here's the world's population, and Asia comprises a large number, seven or eight of the, uh, seven of the ten largest countries in the world. We did a survey of the intensive care medicine as a specialist discipline, and of the countries that replied, there were 16 replies. All but three had intensive care training programs. Well, what is intensive care training? When I was a boy, intensive care training specialist was an opinionated, self-reliant man who was good with tools. He was a man, usually a man. Poorly trained, worked far too hard, was obsessive about detail, um, but was self-assessed and often idiosyncratic in the way they dealt with problems. The information was not available to provide good care, but they did what they did. And they did it with a great amount of heart and a great amount of learning. And it's not to dis dismiss the work that was done by my predecessors. They worked incredibly hard to develop our specialty, but they were sometimes poorly trained. Now, education is not really about learning facts, which we have ample access to, but it's training our minds in intensive care to think properly, as Einstein said, to think. One of the problems in intensive care, if we have poor training, is that doctors don't know what they don't know. 
And our aim with intensive care training is to comprehensively train people in intensive care medicine to identify the things they don't know and to work out the things they do know and apply proper, proper therapy. I've been involved for many years with the College of Intensive Care in Australia and New Zealand. And we now have a six year training program, which is a standalone qualification. And we've just updated the curriculum and it requires training time in anesthesia, medicine and emergency medicine, and three and a half years of core ICU training on that six years. There are two exams there's a number of work-based assessments and other requirements. This training program has been running now for 30 years in its current state since 2014. We train about 60 intensive care consultants a year. Other areas in Asia also have well-developed programs. The Indian um, Society has a wonderful program to implement and carry out all the educational uh, activities um, of the Fellowship of Intensive Care of, of India, and they also have a diploma, a slightly different level of intensive care training. Both these educational programs promote intensive care as a specialty, train young doctors to learn the specialty, the craft, and to practice it. Intensive care varies throughout Asia, and this is the data we currently have about the number of intensive care specialists per head of population. Now, some of the areas we just don't have data on, but as you can see, it varies from one intensive care specialist for uh, 27,000 people in Australia and New Zealand to a one in 450,000 in Sri Lanka. So your access to a trained intensive care specialist depends on where you live. Now, the ideal intensive care unit would be staffed by intensive care specialists who are trained and dedicated to that specialty. They may have other jobs during the week and during the weekend, but their main job needs to be to be skilled at and to deliver intensive care practice. When we looked at the examination processes that these people went undertook, all of them, bar one, had a, an exit exam and many had an entrance exam or a primary basic science exam early on. The components of the final exam were interesting. Every one of the exams involved an oral component. I think it's important. It is in the oral examination whereas rather than a written examination where candidates are allowed to express themselves and be asked questions specific to particular topics and those topics that are explored. So all of us believe that an oral examination in intensive care is important. We also believe that the training is not just at the end, and almost all the programs had other courses that were required to be done during that training program. Here, courses in intensive care, including life, uh, airways and advanced cardiac life support, were thought to be important and trauma. The courses are important. Now, there are a number of courses available, and here, this is one in Singapore, teaching nephrology. But it's important that we don't just require an exam, we actually have to teach the stuff that's required. There are available a number of courses through the basic collaboration, um, uh, beyond basic uh, mechanical ventilation and nephrology, and other courses as well. So I think what we need in Asia is a comprehensive training program. And there's an opportunity to develop a context-specific, cost-effective, locally deliverable, and resource-appropriate training program. It needs to be practice-based for both training and assessment. It needs to provide training at the local site, not going to Europe or Australia or New Zealand or somewhere else to get this training. So the proposal is that the Asian Pacific Association of Critical Care develop a fellowship. And this should, fellowship should be able to be delivered at the local site. This fellowship would be able to be delivered by
by local communities. We have no intention to try and develop one in Australia and New Zealand or in Japan or in Singapore where they already have developed systems or in India where they have a well-developed system. These, this fellowship will be for countries that, know, that are in the early stages of de development of ICU and require a training program. I want to talk just briefly at the end about the second most important in the person in the ICU. The most important person in the ICU, of course, is the patient. The second most important person in the ICU is the nurse. I believe that without good nursing, good ICU just does not happen. It fails. This is uh, some Asian country, or lots of countries, but the... Um, the doctors per thousand of population, based on WHO data, and you can see that it changes from Switzerland down to Indonesia. Large number of countries, a huge range. This is the number of nurses per thousand of population, and again, it varies. Now, obviously, in different health systems, there'll be access to medical and nursing staff is different. If we create a, a plot, as I have done here, of the ratio of doctors to nurse, and then the number of doctors per thousand on the X graph, you can see that that varies. Countries in Europe often have a large number of doctors and a moderate number of nurses. New Zealand, Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom have about three to four to one nurses per doctor. And that's true also in other countries. In Asia, we have a small number of doctors, but a very small number of nurses. And the nursing ratio is much lower. Now, an intensive care unit, you need, in a good intensive care unit in Australia, you get about one registrar per bed by the time all the rostering is taken account. 0.8 to 1. For each bed, you need five nurses, or five and a half nurses, to run one bed. So the ratio in ICU is about five and a half to one. In Asia, it's more like one to one, and that's why we end up with one to four nursing ratios in ICU. It is impossible to deliver the level of care that's required. This is a bit old, this data, but it's from an Indian ICU, and just demonstrates that the TIS work, the amount of work done by a, work in, a nurse in India, is about three times higher than that we've required in other areas, in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. It's impossible for those nurses to provide excellent care, although they would aim to, and often train to, but cannot deliver it. Intensive therapy, if you're doing one to three nursing and one to four nursing, is impossible. So... Optimal intensive care, what does it look like? We've got to have the best treatments. We don't really know what they are, but these need to be researched and evidence-based. We need the best doctors. There's no question we need bright, well-trained doctors in intensive care, but we need better education specific to intensive care for those, pay, for those doctors, and they will require some formalised training. And we need the best nurses. They need to be motivated and trained, empowered, and we need them in high numbers. So the roadmap, what do we need to focus on? We need to focus on finding out what to do through research, and we need increasing Asia-Pacific research. Doing what we know through training and retraining those that are not trained and retraining ourselves, and doing it consistently through staffing levels, and providing quality assurance to make sure what we want to deliver is what we are delivering. Thank you very much. So we need to train senior doctors for now. We need to train junior doctors for the future. We need to train nursing staff if our specialty is going to survive. And we need to improve quality using our nursing staff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ross. Um, I think we wait for a Q&A after my talk so we can yep. wrap up this session later.
Que su... Thank you very much. Um, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my task today, I'm going to spend about next 20, 25 minutes discussing about the roadmap to an optimally excellent ICU and focusing mainly on Thailand's or developing country perspective. Um, I don't have any potential conflict of interest to disclose re uh, regarding this presentation. Roadmap is something Thai people are very familiar with in the past few years because our um, government have many roadmaps for us to follow. Uh, most important is about roadmap for election. Uh, I, I don't know when yet, but hopefully next year. So I think we, need, we should, should just come back to basic. What, what is road, roadmap to excellent ICU? I think road, roadmap is a tool to tell us where we should heading to, so at least we have to know where we want to go. And the destination in different countries probably may be different because we start with a different point. So we, want, we need to know where we want to go, but we have to know first where are we right now. And then we want to know how we can go there. So that, that's strategies. And we have to know timing sequencing of what should be done, which way we should go first, follow by, by what. We cannot, cannot do the same thing all together. So that, that's the principle of roadmap. So I think to, to, to um, I mean, produce the, um, I mean, workshop, the roadmap that is, that is make sense, you should start with current status. And then we should try to define the end point, what we want to go in a period of time. We think about initiative, what, what we should, what is the most important, and we set priorities. And then we have a roadmap development by putting the time frame on this initiative. So that, that's, that's very important to do analysis about uh, where are we right now, and we need to set priorities, especially in the resource remitting country, such as in Thailand, I think our priority is not to have ECMO in every hospital. So we have to go back to basic. What will make our ICU to be excellent? So this is our vision of TSCCM. We have a vision that we will be a leader to improve critical care practice in Thailand to international standard. And we think we are trying to deliver that by many means right now. What, 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 what do I mean by optimally excellent ICU? I think that is common concept of what is an excellent care. So you have to have the most important in ICU is a safe care. Safety is the most important in ICU treatment. You have to have effective, meaning that you have to provide evidence-based treatment that results in better outcome. I think that's, that's, that's the basic concept. You have to have the patient-centered ICU. I think this concept is very important. You have to have a tam timely management that can treat the patient effectively. The most important about optimally excellent ICU is about efficient. How can we use our resource, not only money, but also a manpower? The, 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 the nurse, the staff, how can we use their time, their resource, Efficiently, okay, that's very important. And also in Thailand, a uh, developing country, because we have limited resource, equitable, how can we make sure that everybody have the same access to in intensive care? We can develop very high-end intensive care, but if we still have many patients who don't have access to just you know, minimum intensive care treatment, I don't think that can be called we have optimally excellent ICU. So I think when we discuss about the ICU care that is optimally excellent in our country, we should also focus on efficiency of treatment and equitable that people have access to important care. 
So where are we in Thailand in terms of our ICU? I think we have many data coming out from the studies um, commissioned by uh, TSICM about our status in ICU. I will share with you some data about the ICU care in Thailand. This is an ICU resource study. That study more than 150 hospitals in Thailand. And we found that it's only um, very a few hospitals that have intensive with working full time. So we start with uh, not enough intensivist and also the nurse specialist intensive care. We have um, trained nurse and you can see that in Thailand nurse is a very important staff working in the intensive care unit. So I think that is very important that right now many ICU depends on the expertise of ICU nurses. So that is why we need to focus on uh, training and improve the excellence of the nurse in the ICU care together with produce and, and have more trained doctor as an intensivist. And we have a data showing that in Thailand, if we can provide a closed ICU system, you will result in better outcome and reduce mortality. I think this is a fact all over the world, but it can be shown in our own data that we should moving towards close ICU system, that's very important. So I think this is giving you some idea about our, our uh, recent, our, uh, what, what are we doing right now in terms of ICU care. And I think in the future, uh, this is a, it's the same trend in our the world that the hospital must be smaller. We treat more patients at the outpatient at homes and the ICU should get bigger and we should have more beds as an ICU beds because the patient will need um, critical care should stay in the hospital but someone who can be treated as an outpatient or at home should be treated outside the hospital. So we think in the future or even right now the hospital should get smaller but with a higher percentage of ICU. So in Thailand we have some idea that we might developed intermediate ICU in the smaller hospital and keep the sick patient in the tertiary care center in the major ICU, something like that. So my idea, what is our priorities in our roadmap to, to heading into the um, excellent optimally ICU? So I think the first is the infrastructure. We have to have the, the I mean safe and then adequate infrastructure of ICU design in all the hospital. But in different level, like if you have provincial hospital, you have to have at least some standardized what type of ICU should, what care you can provide in that level. And then if you become tertiary care, what you have to have. Surprisingly, we still don't have that standard in, in Thailand, in which hospital, what type of ICU what, what uh, tools do you have and how can you decide that ICU? So that is, I think, the ICU infrastructure, ICU design. I think that's the, um, the one of the most important that we should have. I think that evidence-based has been suggested that you have designed ICU properly, you can improve the outcome not only for the patients but also for, for, so for the staff and also for the family. I think the, the way we design ICU as a um, big space and then without any separate room might not be the way to go. I think that if we should have the, some infrastructure that support like a more space for more working space, more space for IT and um, medical records and we should have separate rooms for patients. I don't think that we have to have all separated room but at least you have to have some basic how space per room, ventilation, um, you know, uh, some essential um, instrument such as a sink or something like that and also some type of isolation. Surprisingly, even though we have a lot of epidemic flu or some contagious disease, many hospitals still don't have that basic AC, ICU design such as isolation, negative or positive pressure. So I think this is something that we have to plan and then we have to try to uh, improve all the infrastructure of ICU. 
you are in the Pumisili Mangkalanu Son uh, building, which is uh, one of the biggest standalone building for IPD. We have um, 1,200 beds, and we have about 10% uh, ICU beds in this hospital. Secondly, we should move into the base organization of ICU team. As I mentioned that, we should move towards a closed ICU system if possible. That meaning we have to have adequate staff and also team, including nurses, nutrition, rehabilitation, and we also need the system of care that include end of life uh, care and also end of life facilities to integrate into ICU care. So as, as I mentioned that most of the ICU in Thailand still work as an open ICU, meaning you can admit patients by the attendings and you don't have a team of intensivists taking care of them. So it has been shown by all the data that closed ICU system work much better. But to move into closed ICU system, you have to have enough uh, staff, in, including intensivists. So I think try to train and produce more qualified intensivists is something very important in, in Thailand and all developing country. The third important thing is about the effective and safe ICU practices. We have to build up the ICU working culture that use, adopt evidence-based and proven efficiently practice that should consider about cost effective of management. This is important to have our own data and our own guideline. We have to have the standardized uh, risk prevention program, such as web bundles, um, something like that in our ICU. And we have to measure outcome. Uh, right now, there are many KPI that we keep monitoring. But to measure outcome and compare it with other institutes, uh, with our friends in other hospitals, is very important for our continuous improvement in quality. I think it needs to be done. And I think the KPI or uh, standard of treatment should be integrated into the hospital accreditation program in Thailand. So we, as Professor Jit mentioned, evidence-based medicine is very important, but we cannot just stop at evidence-based. We have to look into also the cost effective of, of, of the treatment and select the one that is most benefits, both effectiveness and efficiency. We monitor such uh, complications such as web and um, lie infection. I think that's very really routinely done in, in, in uh, most of ICU in Thailand. But we have to measure other outcome because no matter how hard you work, they don't consider how hard you work. They consider what you delivered. If you cannot show whether what is the outcome of the treatment that you deliver, it doesn't make sense to say you work very hard. So people measure the outcome of, of what you deliver. And I think the most important things that we have to consider is about efficiency of ICU care, how we can make use the most of the resource we have. So I think right now we should uh, focus on the admission criteria. I think uh, because of our culture, sometimes ICU in Thailand has been used inappropriately and we found out that sometimes we use ICU as an expensive end-of-life care area. Right? This is an example of my ICU that sometimes we have a lot of patients who have, doesn't have meaningful outcome from ICU, but with many reasons, they're being admitted to ICU and, and stay there for a long time. So I think that is a very important issue. We also have to have um, palliative care and end of life, not just in ICU, but I think the most important to start end of life or palliative care concept as soon as possible. It might, might sound to be uh, strange for um, um, someone from the Western um, culture, that, but in, in Asian and in Thailand, end of life discussion or palliative plan is not something routinely done. So we found out that if we discuss about this early on and we prevent unnecessary admission to ICU, I think it is the most important way to go. We also need to look at intensive care or critical care without boundaries, meaning that 
As Dr. Jit mentioned that treat them early. Don't be aggressive in ICU. You have been aggressive seeing the patients at home or in our patient to prevent the deterioration of the patient and they will need ICU later. And no matter how aggressive we treat them in ICU, the result is not as good as we treat them early. So I think admission criteria, the concept of aim of life is very important. So integrating palliative care in critical care, which is, I think people think of this totally different, but I think this is very important. So you have to apply palliative care early on in the patient who are very sick. Step-wise critical care, I mean, meaning that the critical care shouldn't be provided only in ICU. We should provide outside of the ICU, including early intervention and prevention, rapid response team, early warning system to prevent the patient become very sick, and telemedicine and monitoring to reduce the work workload of our staff. I think one problem we see in ICU is sometimes we spend time in non-nursing or non-treatment management, like a documentation, something like that. So we have to reduce that workload and pay, more, pay much more time to the patient care. So if we can apply effective electronic medical records, health information system into our, our ICU management, that will be very helpful. This is one example that uh, in our neuro ICU, they apply the telehealth by using the telemonitoring, and our staff can make it round at home. So we can visit the patients and then say hi to them and then make sure the resident is not sleeping when they are on call, something like that. So I think this works very well in our neuro ICU. So uh, it's helped to make use of the staff time and the attending can follow up on the patient effectively and make the patients much more comfortable. This is uh, the program we use here. So I think that's, I think in my perspective, that is the four major um, things that we have to try to achieve. And I think in different situation, in different hospital, you might have a different road roadmap to follow. But as a TSCCM strategic roadmap, to support that idea, we will provide education. So now we have fellowship training, and we start having short course, you might know about that, like a breath workshop that improves ventilator management. We want to do more about monitoring uh, short course management system, and we want to do more training nurses, or even the doctor, maybe three month courses. That's on the process of developing. We want to do the meaningful research mainly to answer some specific question in Thailand about our critical care situations. So I think we have uh, many papers leading by Jang Tewisak that have been published about the situation. And we want to standardize critical care practice in Thailand by working with the um, authorities such as HA to have standards, local guidelines, to have ICU or critical care standards and requirements because you can pass the um, HA accreditation, something like that. So I think this is um, um, our you know, <laughs> overview of the, um, the way to improve ICU care in Thailand with our own perspective. So I hope that the future is, depends on what we do and plan to do today. So I hope that we can go into the direction and vision we hope for. Thank you very much. I think we still have time for questions, comments, or any discussion. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, please, please feel free to go to the microphone, introduce yourself, and we would like to discuss and love to answer the questions. I have a question. Um, what do you think are the big barriers to progressing intensive care in Thailand today? I think um, the first is uh, I think the first is of um, um, 
resource like of the specialist nurse and agency risk. That's one thing that we need more of that. And also some barrier about the cost of treatment. You know, Thailand is under scheme of um, universal coverage. And then sometimes the cost of treatment in ICU has been considered as very really high cost and might not be efficiently used. So I think there, there are some barriers about the manpower and, and money. If in your units do you have available uh, dedicated intensive care specialists, or is that a difficult thing to talk about? It's not enough right now. Yeah. I should mention only one third have the intensivist. Yeah. And if you look in our intensive care base in Thailand, if you go to the big tertiary hospital in our country, you will see more ventilators outside ICU than in the ICU because we don't have enough space in ICU. So we can see someday 40 or 50 ventilators in the floor yeah. being managed, which is, I think is very unsafe. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I think one of the problems is it's unsafe because of nursing levels, and um, but there's also the risk that some of those patients should not be ventilated, and the, and the getting optimal ventilation and optimal care is difficult. And so the more you ventilate, the less good you do because they're being you know, damaged by a ventilation. I, I feel that the most important barrier is the ad adoption of sufficient economy principle into the concept of uh, both the planners, uh, the healthcare workers, uh, and the patient themselves. They have to have this concept of sufficiency, economy, moderation, and so on. Uh, and if we can use that as the principle for discussion, then we can find ways forward. So intensive care practiced badly is the most expensive and futile therapy. Practiced well, it is very, very cost effective. The point is you need to have people who are trained and understand what they're doing, so they're applying the right therapy at the right time to the right patients. If it's applied, we will just ventilate everybody or we will just provide dialysis for everybody with no assessment of how well that patient will do and what benefit they will get from the therapy. We will waste a lot of money and cause no good. I think we, do, we need to train people so they understand this and then dedicate those people to providing care for the critical ill. And that's, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, to select the, the right patient at the right time is very important. In Thailand, sometimes we see something is too much in the group of patients, and sometimes it's you know, too minimal. So yes. it's not equity. Yes. So that's a very important issue. If you get too late, they don't have a good outcome. Sometimes we provide too much, and they don't have good outcome either. So I think that's very, very, very challenging for us to provide a balanced and efficient critical care. Uh, how about in, 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 in uh, Australia and New Zealand? Do you think what, what, what is the problem right now? Do you have any problem with cost or...? Uh, I mean, cost is, is a big issue and, and public expectation is the other issue. Um, we are spending some time trying to educate people that the therapy is not the answer, it's the appropriate therapy. And we're having a problem with people demanding therapy that is inappropriate. They want antibiotics for small things that don't require antibiotics for viral illnesses. In ICU, they want ventilation for people that ventilation will not improve. And we're having, please do everything for my relative. And you say, well, what is everything? Is everything chemotherapy and bilateral amputations and, and nephrectomies? Because we can do those therapies, they won't help. And sometimes ventilation, pressure support and renal dialysis will make no difference to the outcome for that patient. And when it doesn't make a difference, we should not be providing it. And that's the, the demands from, from relatives particularly about what their relatives should have when it's inappropriate. The internet and the free information has not helped us in that regard. As they they're more, feel more empowered to ask for things and less informed about the true cost and the true benefit of these therapies. 
in Thailand, I think we have the same problem with um, uh, try to differentiate between what they need and what they want. And then um, with the false demand by, you know, like a commercialized um, um, management. So there are a lot of false demand and false understanding from the patient's point of view. So they have lots of requirements. And because we under universal coverage, so we are supposed to responsible for everything. Yeah. So that's 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 really challenging time for us. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So I think I we really learned a lot from the session today. So in case I would like to close this session, we I have a, a token of appreciation for. Uh, two speakers, so let me present to Dr. Professor Kit first.